The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Dig deep into the collection stored at the University of California, Berkeley's Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and you're bound to be surprised. So this is our largest egg in the museum. It's an egg of an apiornis, which is a, uh, an extinct bird from Madagascar that was called the elephant bird. It's bigger than any dinosaur egg. Some of the things you'll find are so fanciful, you might think you've been transported into a world of imaginary beasts. This is a, an extinct relative of the manatee, the stellar sea cow, and they lived in the Bering Sea. Um, and went extinct in the 1700s, only 30 years after being discovered because people hunted them to extinction. Monica Alby oversees the preparation of the animal skins and skeletons that make up the museum's collection of more than 600,000 specimens. Ready, guys? Ready to see the muskrat, the cutest uh, animal on the planet? <laughs> oh. 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 Isn't it so cute? Oh. The key difference between my job and a taxidermist's job is taxidermists pose the specimens, make them look like they're alive, Whereas my job is to get the specimens into cases and drawers and boxes and so that they're usable for scientists. As a preparator, Albi must make sure that the specimens are as uniform as possible to make them useful to researchers. So it's important to put wire in the limbs of the specimens to, to basically hold them into the core of the animal because the skin dries out and then it feels very much like paper and so it's not very strong, so they could easily break off if they didn't have wires. We want the specimens to last for over 100 years, for as long as they can. And if they're prepared in our exact way, then they will, they'll last for that long. Preparing specimens that last forever has been a goal of the museum since its creation in 1908. The project began with an endowment to UC Berkeley from CNH sugar heiress Annie Alexander, herself an accomplished naturalist. She proposed as the museum's first director, then 30-year-old ornithologist Joseph Grinnell. Grinnell's childhood made him an interesting candidate. Grinnell spent his early years on, um, on a Sioux Indian reservation and he was kind of the the godchild of Red Cloud, the famous Sioux chief. And so he had uh, extremely keen observational powers. And not only did he have keen observational powers, but he had a really questing mind. A lot of other people at the time, even naturalists, were still on the, oh, you know, let's just catalog all the different forms of life. So, you know, this is what a duck looks like. And Joseph Grinnell was thinking, you know, how are these animals changing? Look at even within a species, look at how different they are. And how do they vary and why? When he looked around him, Grinnell also saw that human activity posed an immediate threat to California's wildlife. Cities were expanding and agriculture was expanding primarily in the Central Valley. And so areas that used to be pristine natural habitats were being converted to agriculture. What he saw jolted Grinnell and his colleagues into action. They spent the following three decades surveying 700 sites up and down the state. At each location, they took meticulous notes about all the wildlife they saw and trapped specimens to take back to the museum. Everything I've ever heard about Joseph Grinnell um, has been that he was just a workhorse. I mean, every second of the day, he was thinking about animals and wildlife and ecology and conservation. I did all the driving, and we never traveled one inch but when he had that notebook open and writing notes. 
100 years later, these records are poised to become more valuable than ever. Researchers are revisiting 200 of the 700 California sites Grinnell surveyed. One of the areas being resurveyed is the Yosemite transect, an 830 square mile rectangle that includes part of Yosemite National Park and extends to its east and west. Jim Patton, the museum's emeritus mammals curator, is coordinating the resurvey of the Yosemite transect. The Yosemite transect is special because it's one of the first that was published as a distinct book called Animal Life in the Yosemite by Joseph Grinnell and Tracy Storr in 1924. And that book was published and written as much for the layperson as it was for the scholar. The book was based on the naturalist's actual field notes, which included detailed maps that allowed Patton's team to retrace Grinnell's steps. The notes also reported on each one of the naturalist's adventures. July 25, 1915, Sunday. The Lord has set us a wolverine, was caught by all three of the traps, struggled and bit the stock of the gun, taking a piece with a quick snap. In Grinnell's days, the specimens were either shot or killed with traps. Today's researchers kill far fewer animals. They trap most of them with live traps and bring back clips from their ears, which can later be used for DNA testing. During his first resurvey trip to Yosemite in 2003, Patton began to see many of the same peculiar small mammals that Grinnell's team had found. The pinion mouse is easily recognized because it has huge ears. Uh, I call it Dumbo, the elephant. And I picked up my traps that morning, uh, had one that was closed, opened it up, and the first thing that I saw were these big ears. And I would go, whoa, what is this thing doing here? Patton had found the pinion mouse at a much higher elevation than Grinnell ever saw it. Patton's team then moved to even higher altitudes in the Sierras in search of animals like the alpine chipmunk and the bushy-tailed wood rat. These were animals that were common in the Grinnell period. We couldn't find a bushy-tailed wood rat up there on this trip. We could barely find an alpine chipmunk. By the end of the resurvey in 2007, he had found that nine species of small mammals were no longer found at their original lower elevations. The alpine chipmunk, a small, thin-tailed chipmunk unique to the Sierra Nevada, had climbed the most. The animal was common in areas around Tuolumne Meadows in 1915. And Tuolumne Meadows is about 8,900 feet. Today, we can't find the alpine chipmunk below elevations about 9,600 feet. So it has retracted upwards apparently by about 1,800 feet. What had happened to the low-elevation alpine chipmunks? A snip from the cheek of the Grinnell-era specimens was enough for genetic testing. A comparison of the Grinnell-era alpine chipmunk population and today's showed that the low-elevation community had died off. They just disappeared. I mean, the lower-elevation populations disappeared. They didn't move up in elevation, they just disappeared. Their demise means that, as a whole, the alpine chipmunk population is now less diverse. And this has consequences for the species' long-term survival. After all, as Darwin taught us, it's the total pool of genetic diversity that's contained within populations that provides those populations the ability to survive over the long run because that's what natural selection operates on. So if you lose genetic diversity, you're losing the, the, uh, the buffer, the genetic buffer that a species uh, can utilize in the long run for its to survive. And the alpine chipmunk is a bellwether for other species. Here is a species that is being impacted by something where its range is changing dramatically that may affect its long-term survivability in the most pristine areas uh, on the Sierra Nevada. Now that ought to be telling us something uh, of concern. Researchers point out that the alpine chipmunk's ascent correlates to the 5.4 degree increase in Yosemite's temperature over the past 100 years. 
Because of this change, Lyell Glacier has shrunk by half. This warming trend bodes badly for the species that have moved upward. As we project what climate change is going to be over the next 50 to 100 years, uh, we can project how far up the mountains those species are going to continue to retract. And we can project when they're basically going to get pushed off the top of the mountains because there's no sky hook up there to protect them. Only subsequent resurveys will tell us whether the alpine chipmunk will become just one more of the curiosities stored in the museum. In the meantime, the museum is already training a new generation of naturalists who, like Joseph Grinnell, are willing to get their hands dirty, meticulously keeping track of California's precious animals. It's so beautiful. 